My name is Jeff Morgan. I'm from Dallas, Texas. I want to discuss an attorney general opinion from John Cornyn, uh, JC-0153. This attorney general opinion was written in 1999, and this was actually done in, in request to a request that was done by Sanfronia Thompson. Sanfronia Thompson, who's been in the House of Representatives for years and years and years, House of Representatives Committee of Judicial Affairs, back in July 21st, 1999, she had a letter that she was writing to Attorney General John Cornyn. Dear General Cornyn, I'm forwarding several documents from Mr. Charles Bailey, who has already contacted your office. It is my understanding that the answers to his questions may already have been researched. Basically, he has two questions. What effect do the words forced to sign under threat, duress, and coercion have on a te an official Texas state document when the signatory places these words below his or her signature? Does such an action constitute a voidable signature? Is such a signature legally binding or valid? Could additional terms uh, make it valid and binding? And the second question is this, what effect do the words not a subset to the contents of this document placed below a signature have on an official state document? Does such an action constitute a voidable signature? Is such a signature legally binding or valid? Could additional terms be added to make it valid? This is signed sincerely by Sanfronia Thompson. Again, she is still in the legislature right now. She has been in the legislature for years and years and years. But I found this to be a very interesting question that was posed to Attorney General at the time, John Cornyn. So his response is right here. Again, uh, JC0153, this was penned on December the 8th, 1999, to the Honorable Sanfronia Thompson regarding the effect of certain protest words written beneath a person's signature on a state document. Dear Representative Thompson, you ask about the effect of certain protest words written beneath a person's signature on a state document. Your letter indicates that you are inquiring on behalf of a constituent whose interest in this issue arises from his attempts to submit an offer and compromise form to the United States Internal Revenue Service with such words as forced to sign under threat, duress, and coercion, and non assumption to the contents of this document written alongside his signature. And it talks about the letter again. Um, he asks about the particular effect of such words written on a state document, although he does not ask about any particular state document. Thus, we consider generally whether a binding agreement with the state is created if a person writes beneath his signature on a document the words forced to sign under threat, duress, and coercion, or non assumption to the contents of this document. In this opinion, we set out the general principles that would apply to a situation such as the one you describe. Other rules might apply to a particular situation. Whether or not an agreement is made might depend upon the particular facts of the situation. Thus, we do not determine whether these words written on the document will create an enforceable agreement in every instance. But I think this is the, the important part right here. In order to create to form a binding agreement, there must be, quote, a meeting of the minds of the parties to the agreement. In other words, all of the parties to the contract must agree on all the same things. There must be mutual assent. There can be no agreement when one party has the intention to make it, but the other has not. As a general rule, if there is not a meeting of the minds on all material terms of the contract, there is no contract. The meetings of the minds necessary to form a contract springs from an offer and an acceptance. A contract is not formed until there has been an offer of contract terms from one party and acceptance of those terms by the other party. An offer must be certain and unambiguous. Certainty is required so that the person receiving the offer can know exactly what he is being asked to agree to. If a person writes something such as forced to sign under duress or non assumption to the contents of this document beneath his signature on a document that is supposed to be an offer, the offeror appears to be saying that he does not agree to the terms of his own offer. In such a case, it could be said that the offer is uncertain and ambiguous and cannot form the basis of an agreement. Thus, these words written beneath the signature on a document may make the document invalid as an offer. In the event a valid offer is made by one party, it must be accepted by the other party in order for an agreement to be formed. 
It's not a forced contract. There's got to be the mutual meeting of the minds. An acceptance of the contract must not change or qualify the material terms of the offer. If it does, the offer is considered to have been rejected and a counter offer is made. There is no enforceable agreement unless the counter offer is accepted. The person to whom the offer is made must communicate his acceptance of the offer. Often when an agreement is offered in writing, a person's signature on the agreement is required to communicate that person's acceptance of the terms of the agreement. If a person writes something such as forced to sign under duress or non assumpsit to the contents of this document beneath his signature on a document offered to him, it could be argued that the person qualified the terms of the offer and thus indicated he did not accept it. In such a case, there is no meeting of the minds on all of the terms of the agreement, and thus there is no agreement. Now, he's taken a couple of examples here, primarily from college professors. Uh, for example, in a federal case from Kansas, a college professor was offered a renewal of his employment contract with reassignment of duties. One of the terms of the offer was that the professor contest any employment issues by following established grievance procedures. The professor signed the contract, but attached to it a memorandum stating, I have signed this contract under protest, and this signature should not be construed as a waiver of any rights that it might have to retain the former position or to contest the reassignment. The court held that the protest words, the protest words, coupled with the professor's expressed intention to contest the reassignment by any means instead of the established grievance procedure, materially altered the terms of the college's offer. The professor had rejected the offer, and there was no agreement. He was making a counteroffer. Thus, in some cases, certain words written on a document beneath the signature can make the signature void as an acceptance. In other cases, however, it can be argued that where the acceptance of an offer is indicated by a signature, words such as forced assent under duress or non assumpsit to the contents of this document written beneath the signature are merely words of protest that do not qualify or alter the terms of the offer. This type of grumbling acceptance, as it is called, the grumbling acceptance, I grumbly accept this contract, has been found by the courts to be sufficient to form a contract. An expression of acceptance is not prevented from being exact and unconditional by the fact that it is grumbling. But it must appear that the grumble does not go so far as to make it doubtful that the expression is really one of assent. So, for example, in a case from Oklahoma, a college professor was offered an employment contract that could be accepted by affixing his signature beneath the words, I accept the responsibilities of the appointment under the terms outlined above. The professor signed the offer but wrote beneath his signature that he was doing so under protest because he objected to the salary. The court held that the professor's signature on the contract was a clear acceptance of the offer, even with the protest words. The notation amounted to more, no more than saying, I don't like your offer, I don't think it's right or fair, but I accept it. Under these circumstances, the court found that the offer was accepted and a binding contract was formed. A person's conduct might also indicate acceptance of an offer, even if the person's written words suggest otherwise. Acceptance of an offer may be shown by his performance and acceptance of the benefits by the person to whom the offer was made. For example, in, Ma in a Massachusetts case, a borrower sought an extension of a loan commitment from the state housing finance agency. The borrower signed the agreement for the extension, but because he objected to one of the lender's conditions, attached a letter saying that his acceptance of the extension was signed by me under protest. When the lender sought to enforce the agreement, the borrower argued that his protest words constituted a rejection of the condition. Because the borrower had accepted the benefits of the agreement, the court held that he could not disavow the condition. The accepted with prejudice communicated no more that Whitney did not like the arbitrage condition, expected to talk more about it, but grudgingly accepted it in preference for having the MHFA commitment expire. For its part, Whitney accepted the benefit of the extension documents, namely the extension of the permanent loan commitment, without which the project would have been in dire jeopardy it lies ill in Whitney's mouth after obtaining what it needed to disavow the arbitrage condition. 
As these cases illustrate whether certain words written beneath a signature in response to an offer is an acceptance or rejection of the offer depends upon the factual circumstances surrounding the proposed agreement. In some cases, the words may stand in the way of the agreement. In other cases, they may not. Consequently, we are unable to say what the effect of the words forced to sign under threat, duress, and coercion, or non assumpsit to the contents of this document will be in every case. As a general rule, as a general rule, however, these words may indicate that the person signing has not agreed to the terms of the document, and consequently there has been no quote meeting of the minds that is necessary to form a binding agreement. Summary, the words force to sign under threat, duress, and coercion or non assumpsit to the contents of this document written under a person's signature on a state document may indicate that the person signing has not agreed to the terms of the document and consequently there has been no meeting of the minds that is necessary to form a binding agreement. Yours very truly, John Cornyn, Attorney General of the State of Texas. And as I mentioned, he is now a Senator for the State of Texas.